So this morning we're going to start, this will probably be a, I don't know, an eight-week series on what it means to be a Presbyterian, what's distinctive about uh, being Reformed Presbyterian. I'll, I'll kind of use those um, synonymously. Uh, those are kind of the same, for the most part, Reformed and, and Presbyterian. So the, fir- the, way, the place that you start is, and this is the question for every person, Christian or non-Christian, who or what is the authority in your life? Who or what is the authority in your life? That that matters if you're a Christian or a non-Christian. Who or what determines right or wrong in your life? Who or what determines what is ethical or unethical, uh, moral and immoral? Um, Who or what determines the foundation, if you do believe in a postmodern world, in a foundation uh, of truth for your life? And so this morning we're going to look at what the Presbyterian response is because it really is the question of epistemology. Where do you get knowledge that directs you on how to think? how to speak, how to live. And there are different answers, if you're a Christian or non-Christian, and there are different answers within the Christian world. So how, what's the answer to that? So if we look to Scripture, um, that's a good place to start. In the earliest days of, of, of Scripture, God commissions a guy by the name of Moses to write his words, God's words, for his own people. And so you see, this is God revealing himself through Moses. So, for example, Exodus 17, chapter 17, verse 14. After Joshua defeats the Amalekites, Joshua is the general, right? He's the one leading the charge. After he defeats the Amalekites, God tells Moses, write it down. Write this down. Record it. So that's in Exodus 17. So you have Exodus being recorded. In Numbers chapter 33, um, Moses writes about they're going out and they're coming back and their journeys as commanded by the Lord. That's in Numbers chapter 33. So Exodus is being written by Moses because the Lord has told him the book of Numbers is being written. In Deuteronomy 31, Deuteronomy is basically a covenant renewal ceremony on the plains before they enter the promised land. And in Deuteronomy 31, Moses is instructed to write, to put down what God has told him to. So in chapter 31, verse 9, Moses wrote the law and delivered it unto the priests, the sons of Levi. So Moses is is being told to write Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, And we see in Deuteronomy 31 that the words that Moses is writing from God are not just for the clergy, they're not just for the priests, they're also for the people, the people living amongst the tribes of Israel. And the people of God were following the book. Um, It's a smaller book than we have now, but they were following it, they were obeying it. And when Moses finishes writing, do you remember what happens at the end of Deuteronomy? Moses has finished writing, his, his life is going to be over, and the book, the scroll that Moses is writing, is kept in the Ark of the Covenant. It's kept in a sacred religious spot, meaning it has authority and value because it is God's word for his people to listen, to obey, to follow. So it's put in a sacred space. Moses then departs. His, his career, his life is over. Joshua chapter 1. Moses is gone. Joshua, remember, on the other side of the Jordan River, they're going to go into Jericho and begin to take the land, which will take years. The land that was promised centuries earlier to Abraham. And what is it that Joshua does? Now, I'm just going to reference Francis Schaeffer here, his comments on this. Joshua does not try to remember what Moses was doing and let's try to imitate what Moses did. That's not what Joshua did. If you read the the first chapter of Joshua, it was read what Moses wrote and obey it. Follow it. So Joshua is not saying, what should we do here? How do I feel today? What's What's the politically expedient thing to do as we enter Jericho or take on Jericho and then the city of Ai and all these different places? What Joshua is doing is what you do today or what you should do today, which is he's reading God's word and obeying it. He's reading the the words of Moses and he's obeying it. That's what he's doing, just as we do today. Um, the, words for, the words that God had given Moses on how to enter the land that was promised are being followed by Joshua. So, and Joshua is told three things, if you, if you read the book of Joshua, that the word of God should not depart out of Joshua's mouth, that Joshua should meditate on it. So don't let it depart. So talk about it, discuss it, meditate on it, reflect on it, and then do it. Obey it, follow it. That's what Joshua is told. And that is for the Pentateuch, for the first five books of the Bible. And so the canon grows You read with Joshua, chapter 24, the end of the book of Joshua. Joshua's had a long military career. He's been a fantastic leader. He's a, he's a faithful man. It says in chapter 24 of Joshua, Joshua wrote these words 
in the book of the law of God. So now we have a new book added. Joshua has been told to write and is writing the word of God for the people of God. And then God is going to commission others to write um, historical books. So think of the book of Kings. One, we call it 1 and 2 Kings or 1 and 2 Chronicles. Those are historical books. Prophetic books. Uh, the book of Daniel is a prophetic book. The book of Micah is a prophetic book. The book of Amos, Jonah. Uh, and then poetic books. You think of something like Song of Solomon or Ecclesiastes. Those are poet Psalms, the Psalms. Uh, those are poetic proverbs. Those are poetic works. And God inspires and authorizes people like David to write, people like Amos to write. Um, so if you read through, say, the book of Micah, it says in the beginning, the word of the Lord that came to Micah, or the word of the Lord that came to Amos. Uh, or if you read through the great prophet Isaiah, it, Isaiah will say, thus says the Lord, meaning this is not Mr. Isaiah with his thoughts on what Hezekiah should do. It is Isaiah saying, here is what God has told me to do, and you obey it. Not because it's Isaiah's word, but because it's God's word. So thus says the Lord in Isaiah. In, in Daniel, he receives dreams and records them. He's told to write these things down, and he sees some crazy things. Um, and so the point here in the Old Testament is that when God commissions and tells someone to write or to speak, it is not the people of God who decide if it's true or not, or if it's God's word. It is received as God's word, and you obey it or you disobey it at your own peril. It is not up to the people of God to determine. You receive it, and it is authoritative. Um, and that's going to become important when we get to the New Testament and we get into the early church um, in a second. Um, and we've talked about a little bit about this in our church history uh, talks. So the people, my point here is we finish up the Old Testament, the people of God do not have the authority to authorize what is Bible, what is not. The people of God receive it and obey it, or in some cases disobey it, like Amos. It's one of, one of the most interesting Chapters, Amos 7, maybe, begin, where they say, Amos, go home, do not prophesy anymore. They're tired of him. They're telling the prophet who has the word of God to go home because they don't want him anymore. It's amazing. Uh, but we do the same thing, or are tempted to do the same thing. As we get to the New Testament, uh, Jesus, the Son of God, <laughs> calls apostles. An apostle uh, is someone who is commissioned as a follower to be a messenger um, a representative of Jesus Christ to God's people and to the nations. And he calls a guy named Saul, whose name is changed to Paul, who is also an apostle, who's an apostle to the Gentiles, while Peter and others are really emphasizing Judaism and how the fulfillment of Judaism is Christianity. Paul is going to really to Ephesus, to Corinth, to Antioch, to these different cities, and he is uh, an apostle. Um, and the apostles are given gifts that you and I are not given. And there seems to be trouble in the American church today on that because there are apostles, um, air quotes, there are prophets, air quotes. Um, that, that's not really anything at all. The, we don't have apostles. The apostles in the New Testament were given a specific charge of what to do, to commission by Christ. And their charge was to declare the gospel and in some cases to write it down. So Peter's writing it down, John is writing it down, Mark is writing it down, uh, Paul, others are writing it down, James is writing it down. We don't have that authority. We are not apostles, we are not commissioned, and when someone claims apostolic authority, you should probably run the other direction, because they're not helping you, they're lying to you. Uh, that is a false truth. Um, so apostolic, rather, authority, and this is critical here in a minute, is not found in their personal opinions of Paul or the personal opinions of Peter. It is found in what they wrote because they were inspired to write. We'll cover that in one second. So the tradition that we receive is the written tradition. That is what we know is authoritative. Uh, that's huge for Protestants. So two, two examples. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. So 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture breathed out by God. That's pretty important, meaning Paul's not saying, here's what I think we should be doing, and he writes Romans. 
you know, or Peter saying, hey, here's what we should do. I'm going to write one Peter, and you guys should believe this because it's my personal opinion. No, the Holy Spirit is inspiring the writers of Scripture. Uh, it is breathed out by God, the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, teaching, reproof, correction, training, and righteousness, that we may be competent. Second um, verse here, or passage, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Peter writes, Knowing, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. What he's saying is that from the Old Testament into the, into the New Testament, the New Covenant, the writers, whether it was Moses, Isaiah, Daniel, Micah, whoever, they, they didn't come up with their own thoughts and then put it down and say, you should believe this, this is good stuff. No, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Um, in 2 Peter 3, verse 16 and 17, these are some of the final words of, of Peter before he, really they are his final words in writing before he dies, before he's executed. Um, he says that Paul, the Apostle Paul's writings are hard to understand. And he puts them on the same level as Old Testament Scripture. He says they're hard to understand, and some, quote from 2 Peter 3, 16 and 17, twist Paul's writings to their own dis- destruction as they do other scriptures. So what has Peter done? He said some people are, are deceiving you with Paul's writings, just like they do with Isaiah or with Daniel or with whatever, Lamentations, Jeremiah, whatever. He's equating Paul with scripture, okay? Which, as Protestants, we should assume, but it's a good example of Paul's writings were received as authoritative not because we like Paul, because Paul's done a lot of good things. He had the votes. Uh, none of that. Yeah, none of that. It is Paul was an apostle. When he writes it down, it is received as authoritative. I don't have that authority. You don't have that authority. People in Protestant churches that claim that they're apostle so-and-so, and, and we have those. Um, not in the Presbyterian church, thank God. Uh, but we have those. That's not a true thing. That is not a true thing. Um, Paul's writing is on par with Old Testament Scripture. And so the Gospels and the letters of Paul, Peter, John, and others in the New Testament are written and passed around and read and received as Scripture just like you would have the book of Isaiah or the Psalms, um, just like you would uh, any of the Old Testament writings. So the apostolic tradition, the tradition of the apostles was that we receive today is what was put in writing and received in writing as authoritative not any unwritten tradition, okay? So that's Old Testament and New Testament uh, in a few minutes on authority. Now as we come into, okay, Presbyterian, what do we make, how do we make sense of that? Well, first, Scripture is our final authority. Creeds and confessions help us understand Scripture and, and restate what Scripture says. So for us in the ARP, the Westminster Confession is, is foundational. Um, so you... When you join the church, if you're an officer of the church, you, you believe this. Uh, if you don't, we have conversations. Um, Westminster Confession of Faith begins, chapter 1 says, Although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God and leave men inexcusable, yet they are not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and of His will, which is necessary to salvation. Therefore, it pleased the Lord in times and manners, to reveal himself and declare his will unto his church, and afterwards for the better preserving and propagating of the truth, and for more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh, the malice of Satan and of the world, to commit the same holy unto writing, Scripture, which makes the Holy Scripture most necessary. These former ways of God's revealing his will unto his people being now ceased. Scripture is closed. Westminster goes on in in, uh, chapter 1, subsection 4. It says, The authority of Holy Scripture, for which it ought to be believed and obeyed, depends not on the testimony of any man or church, but wholly upon God, who is truth himself, the other thereof, and therefore it is to be received because it is the Word of God. That was my point earlier with the Old Testament and New Testament. They received it as the Word of God. They didn't vote up or down on whether or not we think we should take this... Is received. If you go to the shorter catechism, so Westminster is the Confession of Faith, the the longer, the larger catechism, and the shorter catechism. The shorter catechism, the the second question. So it's the second most important thing to begin with. Says, what rule has God given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy Him? The Word of God contained in the Scriptures of the Old New Testament is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy Him. The only rule. So if I'm up here spouting nonsense. 
about what I think you should do, if it's not biblical, you should reject it, or any person. Any person. So Westminster is clear. We would. I, I know you I know. <laughs> If anyone, any TV pastor, anyone like that who's, who's going off the rails, you have to put it in line with Scripture, with the book. With the book. Let's narrow down to the ARP, the Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church. We have a form of government that is important. Chapter 1 of the form of government says this, is the Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church. God the Father is the source of all power and authority, meaning a bishop isn't. No authority, either civil or ecclesiastical, exists, exists except that which God has established in His Word. The only authority you have is that which is in His Word. Civil authority is instituted by God the Father through civil offices. Ecclesiastical church authority is instituted through the officers of the church in the name of Christ, Son of God and Redeemer. God's authority is given to serve and build up others for His glory. So chapter 1, the beginning of the ARP Constitution, the form of government, says the Word of God is the final authority. And so it doesn't matter if it's a minister, an elder, a deacon, if it's a moderator of a senate, if, if they are off Scripture, they have to be dealt with. Scripture is the only authority. So, first summary point, and then I want to transition to other, other options of authority. What is distinctive about the Presbyterian faith, the Reformed faith, is we are absolutists when it comes to epistemology authority. Source of knowledge for the authority for how you think, speak, and live. It is the Bible. It is Scripture, God's Word. There are no other options. So if, if something comes in conflict with that, the, presby- the good Presbyterian, the good Reform says, um, and we'll talk about that in a second, um, says, oh, that goes against the Bible. No thanks. I'm not interested. Okay? So that is the source of authority for Presbyterians. That's where it all begins. It doesn't begin with John Calvin. It doesn't begin with Westminster. It doesn't begin with Augustine. It begins with the Bible. So, In light of Christendom, in light of Christianity, Presbyterians are a very small number. (laughs) Uh, We covered some of those numbers last week. So what are the other options for sources of authority in the Christian tradition globally? Well, if if you look at the Catholic Church, if you look at the Orthodox Church, and if you look at revivalistic Protestant churches in America today, tradition becomes an authority. So let me explain for a minute. Obviously, in the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox Church, there is unwritten tradition. That's why I kept emphasizing earlier. There's unwritten tradition. And the Pope can, speaking ex cathedra in the office of Holy Father, um, can tell you that, oh, yeah, Mary without sin. Mary assumed into heaven body and, f- and flesh, body and soul. Uh, okay, you're welcome to believe that, but I don't have to believe that because you have no authority. But the Catholics look at tradition and equate tradition, the tradition of Rome, with the Bible. If you think I'm exaggerating, just read the Catholic Catechism, the, the, the recent one, I think it was final, uh, edited in the 90s by Joseph Cardinal Ratzenberger, uh, Ratzinger, sorry, uh, the former pope. That is their, their authority. The Bible, yeah, yeah, that's good, and also tradition. Presbyterians say, no, that doesn't work. Same for the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, I also mention um, some of the revivalistic churches in America today where... And this can really impact any church. It can impact Presbyterian churches, too. We can, we can say that as well. Where traditions of the 1950s or traditions of the 1850s or whatever that tradition is of revivalism or here's how we always did it, doesn't matter if it was biblical or not, those can have weight on how a church or impact on how a church functions. And I don't want to go down a rabbit hole and beat up other, other churches, but... Tradition, American Christian tradition, whether it's D.L. Moody, whether it's Charles Finney, Billy Graham, Billy Sunday, can have an an unhealthy impact on the life of a church and how a church worships on Sunday. Presbyterians, we're not perfect, but we try to say what we do should be scriptural, not because Billy Graham or Billy Sunday or D.L. Moody or Charles Finney did it, you know, whenever, years ago. So the Bible is an authority. That's one option. That's what Presbyterians decide. Catholics, Orthodox, and some Protestants say tradition is an authority. The other option you have, and we'll take a few minutes on this one, is personal experience or experience in general. That can be your personal experience from your personal history 
or it can be cultural experience, uh, emotional experience, um, political correctness. So how does that play out? Well, that, that is what you see in the mainline denominations in America today. And when I say mainline, I mean the Episcopal Church USA. I mean the Presbyterian Church USA. I mean the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. I mean the, the Methodist Church. Um, should we even call them churches? Um, they bring on experience to a level that is, is not biblical. I'll give you a concrete example. Uh, when it comes to the issue of marriage, is marriage a man and a woman? Is marriage whoever wants to be married? If you're in a mainline denomination, um, there is a correct answer to that, and it is however you want to define it. And that is not because they found a tradition that they like or a biblical passage that they like. It is because cultural experience and personal experience tells them that if two people want to be married, it doesn't matter. And so, but God's word is a secondary authority that just comes alongside, and we got to be loving. And so, well, no, that's not how it works. But what they've done is they've brought experience, cultural, personal experience, into their, the technical term would be into their hermeneutic, into their interpretation of Scripture, and said, yeah, we know what Paul says about marriage, or what Jesus says, or what... Jesus affirmed about what Moses said, which is really God's word, but we live in 2021, and that we throw that out the window because of our experience. You can do that. You're just not biblical. And at that point, I cease to see you as a church because you're not biblical. And so I'm not trying to be mean or beat up other churches, but if it's an Episcopal church or a PCUSA church or a Methodist or a Lutheran church that's going down that road, um, you're no longer a church for me. I see you as a political movement, a cultural movement. So your options for authority are the Bible, generally speaking, tradition, or experience. Those are your options, and you can mix them up. But the Presbyterian says, my experience is pretty limited. Tradition, who defines that? I'm going to stick with the Bible. That's, that's the Presbyterian answer to that. Um, Presbyterians historically have been and this goes back to the Puritans, people of the book. People of the book. We read the book. And if the guy up front is saying something he shouldn't be saying that's not in the book, sometimes you fire him, sometimes they were more violent than that uh, with, with the elder, the minister. The word of God is the final authority on all matters of faith and practice. That's why you have to read the Bible, to make sure you're following it, make sure your pastor, your elders, your deacons, whoever are following it. Um, Creeds and confessions are, are necessary as a secondary authority, as a lens. So Westminster is a lens to view Scripture. And so when you read the Westminster Confession, it's not, oh, this Puritan in 1643 thought we should do this. No, it's referenced with Bible verses. Here's where we go to Scripture and see that the Bible is the authority or that God is triune or, or whatever it might be. Final thought here, and then a couple discussion questions to, to finish up. Where the Bible is clear you should be clear as well. Where the Bible is silent, you should also be silent. Um, and that gets into the doctrine of Christian freedom. Um, and we don't have time to get into that, but read, read the last chapter of Calvin's Institutes. Where, where the Bible, and Westminster d talks about this briefly too, Westminster Confession of Faith says we cannot bind the conscience. So if it's not in the Bible, I can't compel James to do something because I, it's in our tradition. And if he doesn't do it, it's sin. No, that, that's sin on me because I'm binding his conscience to something that is not in the Bible. That's what Catholics do. That's what some Protestants do when they say, oh, you can't do that, that's sin. It's like, well, that is your personal preference, but if it's not in Scripture, we should be silent about it and allow for Christian freedom. Um, so as we kind of wrap up and have some discussion, let me, let me start off the discussion this morning and see what you guys think. We're talking, we're talking about authority. What is distinctive about Presbyterians with authority? For American Christians and American non-Christians today in 2021, how do most people, let me start with Christians. Let's start just with Christians in America today. What is the authority, generally speaking, not for good ARP people in the room today, but what is the authority for most Christians in America today? What do you think? And this, this isn't a trick question. I'm just opening it up. I've got my own thoughts, but... This is just, what do, you, what do you think? The average Christian living in the average city in America today, what is their authority for how to live? 
Probably for experience, you know, what yeah. feels good, what feels yeah. good, yeah, being, so. being kind. You yeah. Know, sort of. But everybody, I, I agree with you. Personal yeah. feeling. Yeah, what, you, what you're compelled to feel and experience. Would everyone kind of on the same page with that? I, I think that's probably... Yeah. 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 Feeling. Yeah. Okay. So now let me ask the second question. What is the primary authority for non-Christians in America today? Whatever they can get away with. Make so. it up as you go. Probably. Well, let me let me hold off. What do you think? Self. Self. Whatever, whatever, whatever you can get away with. Feelings. Feelings. So here, here's the, here's the point I'm trying to make. Is there any difference? Probably not. Probably not. But I think there is a difference because I think that, well, I, when you first asked the question, I was thinking of the Christians I know, which... In the general Christianity in America today. Yeah, and I don't know general Christians in America, but I'm just saying that, so even though some groups are off, but in their minds, there's still an influence of the Bible. Oh, yeah. But, so I think it is different because of that, and they may be poorly taught, incorrectly taught, insufficiently taught. But, and they may reject what they know about the Bible, but I still think that makes a difference between the non-Christians and the Christians. Yeah, gen- I mean, again, we're speaking in generalizations. The, the average Christian in America, so we, we've got tens of millions of professing Christians, um, is, is not going to look, again, generalizations, so we, can't, we don't want to argue over minutiae here. Looks, I think we're right, looks to experience what I can get away with, emotions, how I feel, that, that what I see online is compelling. It may throw in some Bible, um, but at the end of the day, there really isn't a big difference between, generally speaking, Christians and non-Christians in America and how they see authority. Um, and so for, that's why I can, I can... I had the f- misfortune or the fortune of being in, in the PCUSA for three years. I can name you dozens of PCUSA ministers who would claim, yeah, we believe the Bible. Yeah, that's great. Come to our church. But what they're teaching is absolute garbage. Her- and, I, and that's not my opinion, that's God's word. So you, yeah, you can throw in the Bible, but at the end of the day, you're still just a political movement. And I mean that for every piece of USA church in the area. In Charles, like, there really isn't an exception. Because I know all of them, <laughs> um, or used to. Like kind of dead to them now. Well, where Christian culture is now is where non-Christians used to be. So, like, whatever path, how, when you take... When you're orienteering, you go in this degree, you take this degree, which is off. I mean, I may be behind you, or I'll just make myself worse. So you may be behind sure. me, I'm farther down the trail, mm-hmm. but I used to think that way, or whoever was that person used to think that way. So maybe it's like that shedding, shedding protection as you go. Yeah, and there, so there, are, there are things in, in the Christian life and experience where you can disagree. So... You know, me and Brian or me and Lib or Gary, we can disagree on. There are things in the Bible that, okay, we can, we can disagree. There's some things, yeah, that's fine. But there are a lot of things that are pretty clear, and that's where Christians, specifically in the main line, we're kind of leaving the Catholics out, they're getting a pass right now. Um, they're not clear on those things. So if you, if you would have said, just, this is the most obvious example, because in 2010 the, the PCUSA made their radical move, which was coming for years, if you were to say in 1980 or 1970 or 1960 um, that marriage is really whoever wants to be married, and not only that, we're going to ordain those people, that would have been nuts in 1950 because the Bible is pretty clear on it. Like, there's not a whole lot of room. We're not going to, me and Gary aren't going to argue over that. It's pretty clear, right? I mean, if you tried to go to a, a, a mainline church in Charleston and voice that opinion, uh, wear some body armor. Uh, if you tried to be, if you were in, in ministry and tried to get ordained, so if, for, I'll use myself. <laughs> and I didn't do this, so don't get me in trouble with, with Catawba Presbytery. If I would have tried to be ordained in, in the Peace USA several years ago, more than several years ago, um, they would not have ordained me even if I wanted to, and I didn't want to, because my answers are not acceptable. Um, and actually what they do to those kind of people is ridiculous. And I think I've shared some of those stories from the pulpit. So they're, they're, not, they're not open to negotiation on this thing. So. I think there's so much ignorance. An example I can think of, I was at a party some years ago, and the book, The Da Vinci Code, was all the rage. 
And this gal comes up and says, I didn't know all that stuff was in the Bible. And I, I said, primarily because it's not in the Bible. And she, you know, she picked the wrong person, Brian. So. I, and they take this, yeah. be it the, a popular book or Facebook or whatever, and they run with yeah. it. They, they, it just... Yeah. So here, here's the next question, because I, I, I really don't want to just be an angry guy beating up on, on liberal denominations, as fun as that is. Um, but it's what? A PCA denomination, too. Say like, that. I'm sorry. But it's also happening in the PCA denomination, yeah. too, especially in Missouri. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We are, we are going to have to ban PCA ministers from Gainesville, Georgia, from coming back to preach here. Uh, just kidding. Uh, yeah, PCA is wrestling, with, on a serious note, is wrestling with what to do. Um, and there are PCA churches that are not following Scripture. And we've, we've seen PCA, slowly, some PCA churches have come into the ARP because they don't want to be involved in the PCA anymore. Um, and so that's a, uh, some good things for the ARP, we, you know, bringing in some, some churches that way that do not feel comfortable. So, yeah, the PCA is wrestling with that. Yeah, I'm just shocked that it yeah. hasn't been a harder stance on something that is very clearly against Scripture. Yeah. The, the, the problem there, and I want to go to one other question, the problem there actually is, and I, I really do not take any joy in saying this, um, the problem there is the seminaries. So I went to Gordon-Conwell Seminary. I'm not sure I would. Actually, I wouldn't recommend. I told the president that, the former president, uh, what they were doing was ridiculous. I wouldn't recommend students go to Gordon-Conwell Hamilton anymore. Um, some of the stuff at Covenant Seminary in St. Louis, I, I, I can't speak too much to that because I did not attend there. Uh, I have a few friends that went there. They have some challenges. Um, they have some challenges there. Uh, so the seminaries are producing the ministers who are a little light on commitment to Scripture. The last question I want to bring up for discussion real quick is this. We have the authority of, of the Bible, the authority of, of Scripture, of tradition. What should be, for a Presbyterian, what should be the role of experience and tradition for our authority? Because you can't just completely cut out tradition. Presbyterians don't do that. Uh, you can't just cut out experience. So what is the role of tradition and experience for Presbyterians? What do you think? Okay, as long as it goes along with the Bible. Yeah? They can be good and bad examples either way. Um, and they're always open to criticism. You know, uh, like any read C.S. Lewis, it's open to criticism. You can say, well, he was wrong about this, and then it's a opinion, human opinion versus human opinion. Um, it has to be set lower, um, but I do think it's it's useful as examples because we yeah. can look look back and see um, we don't have to learn everything um, the hard way, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I I think a couple things to think about. And we'll wrap up here in a few minutes. Experience and tradition. Tradition helps us avoid error. So that's why we, we one of the reasons we spent several months, many months on church history, that, that's really studying tradition, traditions in the church, things that were happening in the church. And it's helpful. Um, it's helpful when you encounter error to know some tradition. Um, so it's, it's helpful. Uh, I had this past week a termite inspector come by, and he, he uh, tried to proselytize me and convert me to um, anti-Trinitarian Adventist non-denominational movement he's a part of. I'm like, dude, you're at the wrong house, man. You are at the wrong house. Like, did you change the bait trap? Did you? Okay, now we can talk. Um, it helps you avoid error. So I'm talking to this guy graciously, and he's just, you know, machine gunning all these verses about why we worship on Saturday. There's no Trinity. And I'm, it's hard to have conversations with those people because they won't listen. Um, but I'm thinking in my mind... He, he, he doesn't know so much of the Bible. He knows a verse here and there. He doesn't know tradition and history to know that we've, we've dealt with the Trinity. Like, it's been debated. People have been murdered over the Trinity. Like, it's biblical. Deal with it. Like, not deal with it. That's the wrong word. Embrace it. If you don't have the Trinity, you don't have the gospel. You have, you have a modalism. You have a civilian. He doesn't know any of that. And I don't mean to be condescending, but it, I tried to talk, and he said, oh, you, you don't, you know, you're, you're following Rome. I'm like, trust me. I'm not Catholic. Um, you have no, no clue. The other part of it, the experience part of it is this, and this is probably where we need more help. 
um, the experience part can help you do what Paul says, speak the truth in love. So it is, it is let me pick a, a simple example. We, we know you, you should not be an alcoholic. The Bible's pretty clear on that. Like, you need to, you know, take care of yourself, you know, but experience can help us rather than if, if we have someone in the family or we have a friend or a neighbor or a coworker who is an alcoholic, instead of just, um, this would be better if we demonstrate. <laughs> so if we know, I'm going to use Brian, if that's okay. If we know Brian's, the, if, I, if I'm allowed to, the alcoholic, instead of taking our Bible, we know the truth and just beating them. <laughs> that, that can be our tendency, right? Experience should say, you know what, like, I'm dealing with someone who, who has that issue. I want to speak the truth graciously and, and warmly to them because of my experience, because they are a friend or a church member or a neighbor or a coworker. That's where experience comes in as an authority to say, I know Gary's wrestling with this, and instead of just taking my Bible and just beating him because I know the right answers, I'm Presbyterian, right? That, that can be, in Presbyterians, that's where we can struggle is, I know the right answers, and Gary needs to hear it, so I'm going to straighten him out. Well, yeah, good luck with that. Uh, you're going you're to lose a friend, but you, the experience part can say, because I care about him and I've had this experience with other people when this issue, I can help. And that's sometimes where we need, as Presbyterians, because we know the answers, usually, but we need help to kind of communicate it. So. Well, here's an example from the Catholic Church, which, if you're familiar with the sound of music, Julie Andrews' character, Maria von Trott, will... The way she's predicted, the way she's depicted in the movie and in the musical is not who she was. She was raised in a far leftist communist household. Okay. Was not a Christian. But what she did, like, she would go to church to hear the mass, the Schubert mass or a Mozart mass or whatever in a Catholic church. And she went one Sabbath to hear the music. Okay. And she stayed to hear the homily that the priest gave, and she was struck like Paul. She had a road experience. Okay. And she goes to the priest and said, what must I do? And he said, you've got to learn. You've got to prepare yourself through knowing. So that's when she took up holy orders to be a nun. Okay. So that, to me, that's much more interesting than the way she was because the, the way she was depicted in the movie. But at any rate, that, that is experience, is it not? It, yeah. is, it is a road, the, the typical road to Damascus experience. And the minister said, you've got to you essentially led her to, I won't say the Bible, but probably, you know, you've got to learn. Yeah, yeah exp- I think experience can help. Us, I think you're right, communicate truth. So uh, this is a more common example, and I've had interactions with other Presbyterian, other Presbyterian elders. Where I just, I'm like, we're not on the same page here. The Bible is clear on marriage. It's a man and a woman, right? That's what we believe. Uh, that's what Christians used to believe. Uh, if, if you're having a conversation with someone who is in a, a same-sex relationship or in a, in a homosexual marriage, we, we know that that's wrong. But we should also know that we, our job is not to beat that person up over that. And just in, in limited interaction with other, in other situations with other minister, ministered elders, sometimes our tendency in that can be just to we want to go after it. Um, and, we, you know, you know, and we know it's we know it's wrong, not because we don't like it or because because the Bible says marriage is pretty clear. Um, so our experience can help us communicate that in a better way rather than just trying to go after people. Um, and I think experience can help us not change the truth because the Bible's clear wherever it's over there. Um, but experience can help us communicate it better rather than just be a Bible answer man or Bible guru. Or we know all the answers and we'll tell you. Um, it's, we have to be committed to truth, but our experience can help us maybe communicate it better sometimes rather than just being uh, an upset, angry, judgmental Presbyterian. We don't back down on truth, but maybe we can communicate it better to people um, when, we, when we have this conversation. So um, let, me, let me pray for us and then kind of take a, a break here and, 